All right, by now you should have read Peter Kreft's uh, treatment of 20 arguments for the existence of God. So we're going to take a few of them at a time, and I'm going to tackle the first five arguments first, because these first five arguments he presents are based on five arguments presented by Thomas Aquinas. Now, you've, maybe you've heard about five ways of demonstrating the existence of God from Aquinas. Now, the first thing you should know is that those arguments are not original to Aquinas. They were the standard medieval arguments for the existence of God. They were not Aquinas originals. Aquinas has his originals. I don't think we're going to get into them. They're very complicated. But in the meantime, he demonstrated to us a few simpler ways to do this, which can be elaborated on later. So, Kreeft lays them out as the argument from change, the argument from efficient causality, the argument from time and contingency, the argument from degrees of perfection, and the design argument. So, I'll go through those and teach them the way I understand them. There's only one major point I'm going to critique him for. As From my reading of Aquinas, I think he's completely wrong in what, what, for one of them and in a major way, but um, we'll get to it. So the first, ar the first argument is the argument from change, and that arg you, you've seen how he presents the argument, and... Um, I'm going to present in my own way that uh, the sort of the basic reality we can a basic reality we can observe in in life is that of acts and potency that we have things that are and things which can be or things that are definitely a certain way and things that could be another way. We probably t I hope we touched on some of these ideas during the Aristotle unit that would be very strange if we didn't. So you have you have things that are and things that can be. And so when something change when something changes in classical philosophy, it's called motion. So if you read Aquinas and he's talking about motion, he doesn't mean like I'm moving my hand right now. That's not that's not the fullness of the sense of motion. Motion is broader than that. It means change. So the way this argument works is basically that you cannot have you cannot have ch you cannot have an infinite series of change without. Um, an unchanged changer. That's not how it's usually phrased. It's usually phrased the unmoved mover. You, you can't have, you can't have um, non-being coming into being from nothing. That every motion from one type of being to another type of being was made to move by another, and you can't, um, you can't, you can't do this infinitely. You can't, um, you can't say the entire world came about from. Well, this blob of nothingness moved itself and became something. Nothing comes from nothing. That's the main insight of this argument. That you can't, you can't have change without something to cause change. And if there's nothing to cause change, then there will be no change, and there will be no world for there to be change. So, so, so the way we can, um, so the way we can apply this here is that. Um, We see we um, we see processes processes of change. We see them we see them transpiring, and then we can conclude that there must be a first cause. That we see the we, it doesn't have to be a horizontal chain of events. That's um not the best way of understanding it. Ra rather, we're talking about um, God as the fullness of being, producing from non-being, being which can change. So that you have God. Who moves without being moved? That God is the fullness of being without any non-being within Him, and through God's power, things are able to change. But, um, so it's sort it's sort of a uh, it's it's our it's argue it's argue basically that there would be there would be no acts there there nothing would be actual unless there was an actualizer that was not subject to the forces of act and potency. So next, the next argument um, is similar. It's um, from efficient causality. Now you remember, you would remember. I hope the term efficient causality from the Aristotle unit. If you don't, uh, well, that's unfortunate. But um, so, I think the first way is a bit more to do with formal cause because form and actuality they kind of go together in Aristotle. This argument from efficient cause. Um, is a bit different. Rather, um, 
rather than dealing with the universal phenomenon of change, this is more this is more horizontal. It's like you, we're going backwards to, to toward the first cause of the chain of events of existence that um, you couldn't you couldn't have a series of events happening without the first event happening to cause all the other events to happen. And so that's, um, that's sort of the insight of this argument that, um, the universe doesn't cause itself, that, um, you don't have a bunch of disparate pieces of matter causing each other to exist that like, like a sculptor causes a sculpture to exist. Rather, God is the efficient cause of the universe. God is the agent, the actor, who makes things to be the way they are, makes them to be, makes them to be real. So if you're having a hard time seeing the difference between the first way and the second way, I can understand that. They are fairly similar. The main difference is that um, the first argument deals with... Um, Change and this second argument deals with what brings things into existence. So they're so you might with I use a sculptor example a minute ago. So it's the difference between um, what makes it possible for a sculpture to be sculpted and how a sculpture is sculpted. It's subtle, but if you think about it, you might be able to get it. All right. The third the third way. Um, is the argument from time and contingency. This might be a bit easier to follow. It's the observation that everything which exists is contingent. That nothing that exists needs to exist. Anything you can think of could cease to exist at any time. And if you gave infinite time to a set of things which do not need to exist, given infinite time, any of them could cease to exist. And, and so we're left with a problem that if... Assuming we had infinite time, and Aquinas would hold that you could have infinite time. There doesn't need to be a first moment. That he would he would say that we only know the world is created from the from revelation, and we know it by faith. We don't know it by reason. So Aquinas would hold that in theory, even though he doesn't believe it because of his faith, in theory, the universe could have always existed. But if it could have always existed, you would run into the problem of it could have always existed, but nothing in it needs to exist. That, and if you give it infinite time, everything could cease to exist. So, so we need to introduce something which sustains everything in existence. That we need something a necessary being rather than a contingent being. So this is this argument holds whether or not there was a first moment in time, a big bang. A let there be light kind of moment, or if Aristotle were, tr Aristotle were right, and there was just infinite time. Either way, you run into the same problem that nothing needs to exist, and if given a chance, everything would cease to exist. So, so it's it's arguing for the existence of God from the uh, perspective of a sustainer. So next we have the argument from degrees of perfection. And this is probably the trickiest argument to follow. Um, the way Kraft phrases it is a bit, maybe a bit easier for uh, modern readers. Um, the way um, Aquinas phrases it is, it makes a lot of sense to the medieval mind. That it's a bit tricky to the modern mind, but the, it's, the basic observation really is that we can have, we can observe that there are beings, and we can observe that there are qualities of each being, which some of which are greater than others. You have limited beings. And there's like this scale of things that are better than others. That you have, you have, you know, some fires are hotter than others, or um, some colors are brighter than others. You know, this this kind of degree of being. And so we can extrapolate this and just start to talk about being in general. That there are lesser beings in general and greater beings in general, and then ultimately lead us to the idea of being itself, which is God. That. God is the ultimate being that, that all being comes from, and from he, and from here we can demonstrate the existence of God by by showing that God is the most exemplary being, that God is perfect being, and that everything that which exists is an imperfect reflection of this perfect being in God. 
And then next we have um, what Crave calls the design argument. Now the argument he presents is basically that um, we can see that the the universe is ordered, that the order of the universe is far too precise for it to come about by chance. So we should appeal to an intelligent designer of the universe and identify this with God. This is not what Aquinas said at all. Now, he's not saying that Aquinas uh, made this argument, but I can tell from his formatting of the article, that's what he's going for. But that's not the argument. Aquinas' argument is that everything which exists exists for a purpose, that even non-intelligent beings work towards intelligent ends, that if I, an intelligent being, shoot an arrow at a target, I'm probably going to miss because I'm terrible at using a bow. But um, if I were any good at it, it would fly towards the bullseye. And so you see there, I am an intellectual being, and I'm directing a non-intellectual being towards an intelligent end, that it doesn't... It doesn't hit the target of its own intellect. It's directed by an intelligence, and so from and so from there, Aquinas infers that we are we are able to um, observe how everything in the universe is directed towards an intelligent end, even though it's not itself intelligent. That everything works towards an end, and so when you when you apply this to humans, then you would you would really see that our behavior is directed towards happiness, towards the pursuit of God, and. Therefore, we could find, figure out from there that God is the intelligent end that all beings, intelligent and non-intelligent, strive for. All right, so those are, that's the first set of arguments. Uh, we'll pick up tomorrow, and um, in the meantime, that's sort of your first introduction to Aquinas. Um, hopefully, you'll get some more um, in coming years.